Alam sa aranang gachami, almang sa aranang gachami, sangkang sa aranang gachami. The second part. Dutiyampi buthang sa aranang gachami. Dutiyang pidhamang saranang gachami. Dutiyang pisangkang saranang gachami. Dutiyang pibutang saranang gachami. Dutiyang pidhamang saranang gachami. Dutiyang pisangkang <coughs> and five precepts. Panati pata vera mani sika padam samadhi adi. Pandina dana vera mani sika padam samadhi adi. Kame su michajara. Vera mani sika padam samadhi yami. Usawada vera mani sika padam samadhi yami. Sura mera yamaja pamadatana. Vera mani sika padam samadhi yami. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <clears throat> hey, good evening, everyone. And tonight uh, is the uh, last lesson for the month. Uh, next Tuesday will be a break, according to uh, Terence, because we have a uh, weekend retreat. So maybe two, maybe nobody has stamina to <laughs> carry on after the retreat. Yeah, so anyway, we'll... Uh, see how far we carry on with this class. So today is the third lesson on dependent origination. <clears throat> so we've already covered uh, the 12 links, right? Uh, next, <clears throat> we talk about the importance of the dependent origination and why is it a necessity? Uh, it's part of the right view. And uh, I would emphasize it's not a uh, theoretical memorization or intellectual memorization of the 12 links is actually a experiential sequential process. A person will actually uh, experience this. They may not be able to explain it theoretically. Yeah? This is a kind of experience. Okay, next. So basically it's a four noble truths. <clears throat> okay, so the forward order is the, basically the first two noble truths, the suffering and its causes. Oh yeah, basically like 12 causes. To 12 things. So we started with this ignorance all the way to uh, <coughs> aging and death. So these are the 12 links. Right next. And the reverse order is the last two noble truths <coughs> the uh, cessation and the cause leading to the cessation of this uh, suffering. Right. So normally the uh, standard 12 links were mentioned from ignorance first. Right, okay, next. <clears throat> okay, so we talk about the uh, definition based on this Paticca Samuppada Vibhanga Sutta. Vibhanga means analysis. So there's a lot of sutta in which, uh, with the Vibhanga, that means they'll give the standard definition according to the suttas. Right, so there are other kinds of definition, post canonical definitions as well. So we will cover that uh, later. So we talk about aging and death, uh, very standard. <clears throat> okay, and the uh, uh, birth, right? Birth, again, we mentioned there are a few kinds of birth. There's the literal birth, your physical body going through this uh, birth and aging and decay. And there's also this uh, appearance of aggregates. So that could uh, also mean a subtle kind of birth. Yeah, uh, like when we feel the breath, the 
arising of the sensations arising of the aggregates. That could also be this definition. Okay, next. And we talk about becoming the uh, uh, the uh, process of existence. You no, know, the feeling of existence. Why do you feel you are you? Yeah. So this is called becoming. So there are various kinds of becoming, sensual becoming, when we crave for material kind of uh, sense objects. And there's this form and formless becoming when a person enter concentration. And then that too will become part of their ego, part of their self. <clears throat> and the, uh, we talk about clinging, right? Clinging uh, to that particular emotion. So craving is the reaction. Right, that emotion then generates uh, this clinging later on. Okay, next. And uh, <clears throat> so basically craving onwards is self-inflicted suffering. Then anything from seven and uh, all the smaller numbers, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, this will be the natural processes. We can't do much about it. Okay, so feeling, you now when we see here, smell, thing, taste and touch, Naturally, there will be feelings of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feelings. And a contact, no, whatever we <laughs> experience, we can't have total control. It's there all the time. Uh, and <clears throat> five is a sixth sense media, right? So we are born with certain organs, right? So if we have our six senses, then we are fortunate to, uh, no, to be able to function properly. So like uh, previously, Jen was talking about the, the scientists call the term, uh, layman term, seventh sense. <laughs> Maybe Jen can uh, reintroduce what's the scientific name for that. People can see sounds or hear colors or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Intertactive. Maybe you can type in the chat because I uh, don't okay. know how to spell. <laughs> okay, let's yeah, so there are these rare groups of people uh, so we, it's still part of the uh, sense <coughs> uh, contact. Yeah? Okay, so it comes from name and form, the five uh, aggregates, right? So according to this uh, <coughs> uh, definition, right? Feeling, perception, so there it is. Yeah? Perception, intention, contact, and attention. So this is called name. And the, uh <coughs> so contact uh, is very close to uh, very interesting. Contact is defined as three things. When, when you have the uh, eye organ, you have the organ, sense organ, and you have the physical object. And when the particular sense organ consciousness arise, then these three things is called contact. Right? So uh, this part of mind is a mental process. Right? So uh, we have this thing, intention, contact, uh, attention. <clears throat> so intention again is uh, karma. We call it sankara. Sankara, your intention. Right? And the uh, <clears throat> four great elements, there's form, yeah? Earth, fire, wind, water. So uh, this name and this form are called name and form. <clears throat> right? So uh, earlier on, the Number 11, the definition of birth, the arising of the, the five aggregates. So this is talking about this. Yeah? So anything mental, the subtle formation of the aggregate that is also considered birth. And the number three, what is consciousness? <clears throat> right, yeah, six kinds of consciousness, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Right, so this is the consciousness. So some people have seven. <laughs> Uh, according to the, uh, let's see the chat, we haven't typed yet, all right. Okay, next. <clears throat> and what is fabrication? Yeah, so we talk about the sankara, the karmic formations from body, speech, and mind, and ignorant, that means still not knowing the four noble truths. That means as long as we haven't overcome suffering, overcome ego, that means we still do not know and we still uh, cling, we still cling to uh, no, everything, yeah? Okay, so this is the uh, uh, <coughs> theory of the 12. And in practice, we talk about cutting from 
desire. So this is the how the 12 links work. Okay, next. So normally they talk about, yeah, dependent on I, on the form, I consciousness arise. So the meeting of the three is called contact. So from contact, then the rest of the links are the same all the way down to suffering. Okay, next. Okay, then we talk about cessation. So in practice, cessation is about <clears throat> uh, cessation and fading away of craving. So if you look at the point with the, the bold letters, so it's midway of the uh, screen. Eh? So now from the remainderless cessation and fading away of that very craving. So from there, once you cut off craving, then you sort of end suffering. Right? So once a person and the ego and suffering, then a person naturally will overcome ignorance. <clears throat> yeah, so the first few links are the same, right? The eye forms of eye consciousness arise, contact, and the feeling. All these are remaining the same. There's no change. Yeah, so the, the factor we can work on, the part where we can take action is on desire. So it's still back to basics, four noble truths. The cause of suffering is desire, so we root out this cause of suffering. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> okay, so today we are starting this uh, <clears throat> topic. It is uh, the post-canonical version. Okay, so the screen might be a bit, I mean, the words might be a bit small, right? so you can uh, maybe try to enlarge the screen. Okay, so for those who, let's say, take up Buddhist studies, can be a diploma course or a degree <clears throat> in uh, Theravada tradition, most probably you come across, or they will use this model, particular model. This is like the uh, post-canonical uh, version. <clears throat> and uh, in other traditions, they will also split into three lifetimes. So we start off from the center of the circle, right? The uh, center, you can see past, present, and future, and right on the center of the screen. So it branch out. So the past will be uh, these two things. If you look at the uh, external part of the wheel, you have Avijja and Sankara. That's the first two factors, ignorance and uh, mental formation, these uh, activities or karma. Right, so this is the past, uh, no, sort of uh, <clears throat> the post-canonical version we say this is the past life. And uh, the main bulk, when we talk about present life, then they introduce this new term, rebirth linking consciousness. If you look at external wheel number three, <clears throat> so this is a new term, rebirth consciousness or rebirth linking. So the uh, Pali word is Pati Sandi Vinyana. <clears throat> Whereas in the suttas, they never mention this term, uh, rebirth linking consciousness. They just mention consciousness. So in last week, when uh, doing the Q&A, somebody asked, what's the difference between the two? Right? This, uh, this version of dependent origination, because they introduce a new definition, a new term, and a new context, then it will become a rebirth rebirth cycle. Whereas uh, most of the suttas, uh, they don't mention this thing called Patisanti Vinyana, this rebirth linking consciousness. They talk about consciousness as depending on your organ, depending on the external object, and the consciousness arise. That means your attention, no? attention arise. So there's uh, the attention rising doesn't have to result in the form of birth. It right? doesn't have to result some conception taking place. <clears throat> so imagine if a person sees, smell, hear, think, taste, and touch, and conception can take place, then I think the world will be overpopulated. <laughs> you see something, or somebody get pregnant. <laughs> you hear something, if someone got pregnant. Uh, so no, not, not in that sense. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the next one, uh, link number four is <clears throat> Nama Rupa, mind and matter. So <clears throat> this mind and matter, according to the uh, post canonical version would be <clears throat> the mind would be this consciousness and the 
Rupa matter would be the womb, the physical baby and the, born, the child. <clears throat> yeah, so it's called mind and matter based on that definition. So they take it uh, literally. Yeah? And the six sense spheres is your, you know, once a baby, the fetus develop, then they develop these uh, six sense spheres, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And then they will have contact. So they can experience the world. Uh, then they have feeling, either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feelings. And they crave, yeah? <clears throat> and then have this uh, pardon, this clinging. And so the rest are more or less the same. And bhava, becoming. And then the interesting part of this uh, model of the illogical part would be there's another birth. <laughs> and there's another decay and death. So they call it tree life, right? <clears throat> so this is the future. So this is how they split the 12 links into the three uh, life cycle model. So this is the uh, post canonical version, which I won't be really much using. So again, we talk about the implication if a meditator does take this seriously, this version seriously, and uh, they believe it to be right view. So uh, some schools, they might uh, go to the extent of uh, requiring to see past lives in order to understand these trough links. Uh, if, you're, <clears throat> if we are, let's say, a number <clears throat> on active side of life, let's say number eight, eight, nine, and 10, Right, so anything happened in the womb, right? Uh, three to seven, we cannot see. Anything happened in the past, one and two, we also cannot see. So we are unable to see the 12 links. So according to them, you have to see your past life to get a complete picture, right? So you can have, you no, know, to be able to see one to uh, at least 10, right? <clears throat> so this is the, uh, that particular version if you believe in this three life cycle model, then uh, some schools might require one to uh, you know, develop these uh, limita, to visual limitas to develop this divine eye and see the past life. So this is uh, one of their ways of doing it. So again, uh, also last week we mentioned about the irregularities or the uh, not so logical side of these three uh, lifetime model is that you know, if let's say a person who cannot see past lives, right? And they, let's say they get enlightened. <clears throat> no, they get enlightened in uh, this lifetime. So in order to get enlightened this lifetime, they need to remove ignorance, right? So how, how are they supposed to do it? Do they need to time travel to the past, you know, to in their previous life to remove this uh, ignorance in a past life, right? So if that's, if that's the case, they remove the ignorance of past life, then they don't need to get reborn in the first place. So this is the uh, illogical uh, portion of this uh, model. But anyway, we will we'll go to the uh, sutta and see how it extrapolated, you know, how it expand and become this version. In fact, uh, yeah, okay, so <clears throat> this is the Sutta, right? A case for rebirth linking consciousness. So you can find maybe one of the rare few suttas that talk about uh, dependent origination in uh, Diga Nikaya 15, this Maha Nidana Sutta. <clears throat> so I'm not a uh, Tipitaka Charya. Yeah? Uh, there are some monks who are uh, memorizers of the entire Tipitaka. They <laughs> memorize all the suttas in their uh, hey, yeah. So for me, I use Google. <laughs> so whatever Google or this uh, access to insight or whatever sutta website pop up, so that would be the answer for me. Yeah. So uh, so far, I can't find any other suttas that talk uh, in this context, right? But I, maybe if you happen to meet these. Uh, Tipitaka Charyas, those monks who are able to memorize the entire Tipitaka, maybe they might find more, right? <clears throat> so again, I'm going to read through 
uh, these uh, verses and see why there's this uh, rebirth linking consciousness. Okay. So uh, I'm just using an, an excerpt, but it's not the entire scripture. <clears throat> From consciousness as a requisite condition comes name and form. So this is a link number three to number four of the dependent origination. So thus it has been said, and this is the way to understand how from consciousness as a requisite condition comes name and form. <clears throat> okay, so again, this is the uh, phrase. If consciousness were not to descend into the mother's womb, would name and form take shape in the womb? Uh, then uh, he's actually having a conversation with Venerable Ananda, the Buddha and Ananda. Eh? So Buddha asked a question and Venerable Ananda said, no, Lord. And the Buddha continued, if after descending into the womb, consciousness were to depart, would name and form be produced for this world? <clears throat> then uh, Venerable Ananda replied, no law. And the Buddha question uh, continued saying, if the consciousness of the young boy or girl were to be cut off, would name and form ripen, grow and reach maturity? And uh, Venerable Ananda said, no law. So this is the particular segment which... Uh, <clears throat> okay, so we start from the first paragraph, uh, the uh, last sentence, if consciousness were not to descend into the mother's womb. Okay, so this consciousness, because this is a sutta, so every sutta there is a commentary. So the commentary of this sutta said that this term, consciousness, eh, if consciousness were not to descend into the mother's womb, so this particular consciousness is called Rebirth linking consciousness, Atisanti Vinyana. <clears throat> so the commentators might be trying to differentiate the sixth sense basis consciousness from the rebirth linking consciousness. So uh, there are a few possibilities, right? If you look at this scripture, so the easy way possibility number one is to say, oh, okay. This is uh, developed much later. Somebody written it later and stuff it in. So this is uh, no easy way to throw off the argument. So this possibility number one and possibly number two. You know, through years of oral tradition, maybe you know somebody uh, memorized wrongly, recited wrongly, or the compilers edited wrongly. So this is possibility number two. Okay. So if we were to use, uh, give the benefit of the doubt and say, okay, this is authentic, right? And this is uh, true to what uh, the Buddha said word for word, then a few possibilities. I, it might be correct or wrong. So correct in the sense uh, <clears throat> that it might be taken out of context. The term here might be taken out of context. So like earlier on, when we talk about the origination of the world or the ending of the world, it might be metaphorical or this consciousness might be different from the sixth sense based consciousness. So this is one way to see it. And the <clears throat> other possibility, if let's say this is truly correct, if rebirth linking consciousness is part of the 12 links of dependent origination, uh, then uh, there won't be contradictions later on yeah, with the other suttas. Uh, okay, so for the time being, I just present you the various possibilities and I'm just going to give my opinion on this. Yeah? So <clears throat> if consciousness were not to descend into the mother's womb, so what it means, uh, the Buddha is giving an analogy. He's not going to talk about the sixth sense consciousness yet. Okay, would name and form take shape in the womb, right? <clears throat> No law. So if after descending into the womb, consciousness were to depart, would name and form be produced in the world? And say no law. Okay, so okay, after you read through all the three questions, right? If the consciousness of the young boy or girl would be cut off, would name and form ripen, grow and reach maturity? So in short, I would summarize to say that once life 
has started. Once conception has started, then uh, basically consciousness will arrive. Consciousness will be functioning. So this will be my take on it. So if uh, a person, uh, let's say they have no consciousness, that would be like stillborn, uh, a child right? In, during conception, if there's no consciousness, basically is to say, you know, the heart is beating, right? The, the body seems to be growing, but then the, sometimes, you no, know, the doctors may diagnose and say, oh, this is a stillborn, no, not receptive, doesn't respond, yeah? doesn't uh, move or whatever. Yeah? So this would be the case. So this consciousness uh, would still be quite, uh, how do you call it, in, quite in par with the sixth sense based consciousness. That means awareness. If there's no awareness, that means there's no, <clears throat> no life, no response. Yeah? So we can also take reference in the, uh, wait, there's the, <clears throat> there are four nutrients to sustain life. So one of which is consciousness. If a person were to be deprived of sense impressions, if let's say during lockdown, no, cannot see, cannot travel, cannot see nice things, there's uh, maybe no television, if let's say people suddenly go for a retreat in a temple, observe a precept, right? no entertainment, and reduce the food intake, some people cannot take it, like as though I like, want to die like that. Yeah? So, uh, yeah, this would be a form of sustenance, sense impression, right? so that is uh, consciousness. So if there's uh, no sense impression, then there will be this uh, lack of nutrient, yeah? mental nutrient to sustain life, right? So this would be my way of perceiving this uh, example, all right? So yeah, now it's nine o'clock. So uh, I'll stop here for the moment and leave the floor open for Q&A. Well, there I have a question. Oh, yes. Uh, it's about the Patisandi Vinyana, right? Yeah. Um, how do you think about the, uh, the the view that uh, when a person dies, there's the jati kita, you know, the pass away, the chuti kita, you know, the chuti kita, uh, the, 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 the death consciousness after that, followed by the Pati Sandi Vinyana, right? And then immediately the person will be born. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, so because this one, when they, I think, I believe because I I, I have some weird experiences like right? going mm. through some of this, you know, passing away and after that. Mm. It is not actually directly followed mm. by a uh, rebirth, you know. Yeah. yeah. There, is, there will be some kind of a gap, mm. then, uh, mm -hmm. some thing going on there, then after mm -hmm. that, there will be rebirth after that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. What is the view on that one here? <clears throat> Yeah, okay. So again, the uh, post-canonical uh, Theravada Buddhism would explain as immediate rebirth, whereas the uh, sutta never mentioned the time frame. The sutta never mentioned the time frame. So I will now share my opinion on why is it illogical for immediate rebirth, right? So like what you mentioned, well, there you are. Yeah. You know, you have intercourse. But, but right? so, yeah. yeah. Repeat again, just now your line was cut off. Oh, it was cut off. Okay. Yeah, so, your so line is example, quite bad. It's, okay, uh, so now it's can, red. okay, so I will share my, my view on the illogical irregularities of this uh, modern take on this immediate rebirth. So let's say if a person want to be reborn as a human, right? do they need to wait for some couple to have an intercourse first before they pass away? Right? Do they need to develop an app on the phone, right? like uh, Tinder or something, 
Yeah, I, I register a couple. Hey, I want to. Very difficult for students. <laughs> yeah, make sure before you have intercourse, you you put the click on this button so that I will know you are about to have intercourse. <laughs> then I can prepare to die. Yeah, right? So, <laughs> so is this the the way? So, uh, I don't think it's logical for immediate rebirth, right? So again, uh, yeah. So again, uh, there's this uh, sutta, yeah. Maha Tanha Sankhaya so, Sutta, which, yeah, you were saying something? <laughs> yeah, I'm saying that uh, in order for a person to be reborn, right, normally mm -hmm. uh, because of karmic bonding from mm -hmm. one, one, one group of uh, beings to another group of beings, actually it comes mm -hmm. in, in uh, come together as a group, right, normally. So meaning if you, are, you die, somebody passed away, normally, mm -hmm. Or she will be reborn to somewhere a family which is uh, close to them, close to that person. Mm. Meaning, amicably, mm. it cannot mm. be that like a very, very uh, coincidental that you know somebody, mm. a couple, you know, uh, yeah. doing the call right. something. Like that. I don't think yeah, I, I agree with that. And that is also going through my experience, my day because I mm. somehow right when I see that somebody passing away, right? Mm. Actually, a a a a. a, a a, a, a period that, that the person can actually still exist, you know, mm. can still mm. exist in the sense that we can still, uh, there is a, a, a presence there, you know, that is actually, mm. I believe so, because I, 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 I gone through this few times, that actually, mm. so it is not immediate, but mm. yeah, what I understand. Yeah, so, yeah, so like I was about to mention, there's this particular sutta, this uh, Maha Tanha Sankhaya Sutta, which I will explain uh, further down the lessons. Uh, there's, uh, they explain the definition of birth. So I actually covered in this uh, during the lesson on karma, right? They need three conditions. So first, uh, you know, first criteria, how, how do birth take place? First, uh, you know, the couple must be having an intercourse and then criteria two, uh, the, the women must have be having the right uh, season, you know, maybe ovulation or whatever. Then the third criteria, a gandaba has to be present, an unseen being has to be present. So a form of uh, conscious, uh, this uh, life force has to be present, right? So these are the three factors before uh, birth uh, can take place. Yeah, but also there's another controversy because Gandhava can also mean, mean uh, a being which is uh, mm -hmm. one of the Satu Maharajika world, right? That's actually mm -hmm. like a goddess of uh, birth, something like this. Is it correct? Then actually he, he look after, you know, the process of the rebirth. This is something, uh, what interpretation of that? But mm -hmm. so this is Gandhava yeah. actually similar like a Naga, Gandhava, Yaka and so on, right? And this one, I'm not too sure how it actually works because it's not mentioned in the Theravada uh, scripture, the actual process. So we, we can always classify it as uh, worldly higher knowledge on a rebirth, yeah, to understand past lives. So that is classified under uh, worldly higher knowledge. Okay, but if you mm. think that it is not immediate, so what is the process, what is the period in between for one death after that going mm. to another rebirth? What is that? Yeah, yeah very, uh, very good point. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, there are two explanations. One could be if, let's say, for those who insist that it is uh, immediate, so might be immediately reborn in an unseen being. <laughs> so this is uh, one way to look at it. Uh, then, if let's say for those who, uh, let's say, for the Mahayana traditions, they talk about the seven to forty-nine days kind of uh, waiting period when they form this uh, mind. Uh, mind body uh, they travel and hang around and are being pulled around by the karmic like magnetic forces. Uh, <clears throat> is it in the form of yeah. beta? Is it in the form of beta? I have no but idea. The logical, <laughs> the logical explanation for that is yeah. somebody is still hanging around. What yeah. form is that? You know, the, the other explanation is the is a beta because they are still in the yeah, world. Yeah, the, the Tibetan tradition gave a term called a bardo. Yeah, bardo. Yeah, mind, mind, body. <clears throat> yeah. So, but, but anyway, uh, I I heard of a few uh, various uh, 
interpretation, you know, there's a certain venerable uh, that maybe he has ability to see. They say heaven might have certain department you know, to handle this uh, rebirth thing. <laughs> so they uh, do the traffic control and HR and uh, direct these uh, unseen beings to the you know, various uh, birth. So there's like a queue up there. <laughs> I, 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 I believe so, Bante, because mm. there is a possibility that uh, certain mm. deva or certain guardian deva actually uh, help the process when a person mm. passes away. If the person, and then after that, see, we, the deva will actually bring this person, you know, uh, escort, ex escorting mm. her mm. to the destination. Mm. There is yeah, also. That, that... <laughs> That would be uh, quite in line with the Buddha's life story. <laughs> yeah. And the Buddha's life story with especially prepared uh, consciousness, you know, then uh, you'll be guarded by the four heavenly kings uh, for, uh, in the, at the mother's uh, womb, then before that uh, sort of consciousness uh, descend. Yeah. Body, yeah. Because Bante, I have actually uh, yeah, have this uh, experience that I, I can... Mm -hmm. Actually, if a person pass away, then after that, there is a process. Let's say, let's say Amitabha, right? If the person mm -hmm. is close to uh, Amitabha Buddha, right? Mm -hmm. The city Garba Bodhisattva and also the, uh, the Amitabha uh, Buddha mm -hmm. actually uh, are, are seen, you know, in a certain way, you know, mm -hmm. actually uh, bringing this person and escorting him to, 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 to that place. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, I, I, that kind of experience I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, again, how, how it uh, works, I'm still not sure. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Interdimensional so bit, uh, teleportation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we, we know that uh, all these uh, other Buddhas in the Pure Land isn't from our universe, yeah, so it's more like a okay. dimensional kind of teleportation, really. Yeah. Right. Okay, Bhante. Okay. okay, all right. Monday, there's a question in the chat by Brother uh -huh. <clears throat> Okay, is the rebirth uh, consciousness same as Gandhava? Uh, if you were to compare, then I would say yes, yeah, very, uh, you know, the same context. You talk about uh, two bodies, <clears throat> yeah, rebirth linking consciousness require two bodies, you no, know? one from the uh, previous life and the conception taking place. Right? So the question is the rebirth consciousness same as a Gandhava. So that's a question, right? So, uh, so yeah. <clears throat> so again, uh, no, why is it called rebirth and not the soul? Uh, so this is a very good question. We call this Buddhist exclusivism. Buddhist exclusivism. Because the term rebirth <coughs> uh, versus reincarnation is uh, invented by post-canonical manual after this uh, the post-canonical version invented the dependent origination with regard to this rebirth linking consciousness. So it's uh, trying to uh, give it a unique Buddhist brand to this uh, rebirth or reincarnation. Uh, for example, I give uh, a common uh, metaphor. You know, like I always like to use the Zen poem. You know, see mountains as mountains, see mountains as not mountains. So this is what the Buddhists are doing. They're trying to see mountains as not mountains. They want to see reincarnation as not reincarnation. Right? The function of these, uh, the Hindus, when they talk about soul and reincarnation, is no travel from one body to another body. So that's called reincarnation. Right? The soul, um, the sort of life force that moves to the next uh, body. Whereas Buddhists will say, ah, no, 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 this is, uh, <laughs> this is not mountain. This is every moment changing, every moment changing, but the function is still the same. <laughs> one body to another body, right? So the function the same, but they want to describe the process differently. So that's why it's called rebirth instead of reincarnation. Right, so uh, hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> okay, any other question, yeah? Really, any question on FP? Uh, Bante, there's no question from FP. All it's right. Very quiet. So that's why it's copy. Oh yeah, uh, Jen typed the shared the link. 
synesthesia, <laughs> S-Y-N-E-S-T-H-E-S-I-A. So that's the scientific term for the seven sense. All right, thanks for sharing. So now I know the word. Okay, if there's no other questions, right? So uh, we take a five minute break. So now it's 9.13. I'll see you back here at 9.18, right? So you can have a toilet break, do a stretching, and we come back for the guided meditation. Okay, see you all later. Okay, can uh, you all hear me? Okay, so it's 9.18 and uh, we're going to start with the guided meditation. So the theme is still on this uh, dependent <coughs> origination, yeah? Just once we are ready, we can find a seat. I think a few people still not yet return, yeah? Xi Ming is still not there. <coughs> His seat is empty. Okay, so we will start here. Yeah? Make sure you're upright, comfortable sitting position. Your muscles are relaxed. Okay, so we are doing the same exercise or same routine. So uh, we start off with the visual cognitive uh, exercise. So we're going to imagine visualizing our hair. So when we visualize our hair, tendency, if we are doing it in the uh, non-meditative way, we will tend to view it as ourself, yeah? my hair. And we will tend to go to the extremes of greed and hatred. Like the greed is, uh, hair is so beautiful, so nice, I love my hair. Right? So this is one extreme, one form of craving, one form of clinging. And the other extreme would be aversion, hatred. Uh, this hair is uh, so ugly, so messy, so untidy. I don't like this fashion. So we have the other extreme, the other end, another form of clinging. So when we try to practice uh, <clears throat> to seize the craving, right? we do the opposite. So we have first is this loving kindness to overcome the aversion so we are going to wish the hair well and happy. So the hair that you visualize, right, on your head, may the hairs be well and happy. That will include all the facial hairs and also all the hairs in the body, may they be well and happy. So from head to toe, we are going to wish all the hairs well and happy, and we are going to observe the state, <clears throat> state of mind, whether is it more clinging, is there more selfishness when we view it in this manner. And then we can introduce the other thoughts of non-craving, which is non-greed. So all these hairs that you visualize from head to toe, they are subject to birth, aging, decay, and passing away. And so they grow long, they get sweaty, oily, dirty, 
and they turn white and they crack and they fall off. Every day there's lots of hair falling off. Okay, so once we visualize, <coughs> uh, finish with this process of the birth and decay of uh, the hairs, then uh, if you want, we can even ask ourselves, is these hairs truly self? So it's a comparison, yeah? Before and after you do the contemplation, <coughs> Is a sense of clinging or sense of self weaker or stronger? And uh, next we can visualize the nails, yeah? fingernails and toenails of the body. And then we can observe, yeah? is this our nails? Yeah? fingernails and toenails. Once the sense of self is there, right, then naturally we'll worry, the train of thoughts, we'll, uh, we'll worry of all those uh, <clears throat> things related to nails. So we first apply the thought of loving kindness, may all the nails be well and happy, all the fingernails and toenails. So this is just a control, a training, using the our own body as a control. In a real life application, let's say outside of meditation, Whatever you visualize, whatever you worry, also can apply the same thing. Eh? First, have uh, loving kindness to the thought and followed by the impermanence. <clears throat> okay, so next, after the loving kindness towards your nails, then we have the thought of non-greed. So all these nails go through birth, aging, sickness, and passing away. <clears throat> The nails grow long, they collect dirt, they discolor, and they due to malnutrition, go through wear and tear, scratches, cracks, and the dead cells of the nails, they fall off every day. And then we can ask ourselves, are these nails truly self? And then we can move on to visualize the teeth, all the teeth in the mouth, and we're going to wish all the teeth well and happy, all the upper rows of teeth, and all the lower rows of teeth, may they be well and happy. And all those teeth, and they go through <clears throat> this birth and death. When they change in shape and size, they get dirty, they discolor, 
and yellow on the uh, plug build up, turn brown and turn black, decay, and the tooth uh, cavities and grow holes, and they get shaky, and they fall off. And we can ask ourselves, are those teeth truly self? And then we can visualize next the uh, skin. Right? May all the skin be well and happy from head to toe the organ that surround the whole body. And all the skin are subject to birth and death. So they get sweaty, oily, dirty, and they wrinkle when it's older, they crack when it's dry and they have all kinds of skin problems. Like uh, rashes, boils, skin irritation. And the dead skin, they fall off every day. Lots of dead skin fall off. So there's a difference eh? if a person were not to apply loving kindness first and straight away think of uh, birth and death of the body part and straight away we worry, think of our insurance, think of visiting the doctor, right? So all these are <coughs> dukkha eh? from clinging. So to loosen or lessen the clinging and this uh, loving kindness uh, helps to soften the mind. Okay, then we can move on to something tactile. Yeah? So there's no need to visualize. And we're going to start off with the breath. <clears throat> One small area below the uh, nostril above the upper lip, one small area. Start off with something small yeah, before we handle a bigger area. So there's no need to uh, fill your lungs, your diaphragm, your windpipe, because the, uh, below the nostril, above the upper lip, we isolate the attention there, the uh, contact of the skin and the air, and we breathe in and out. So there's no need to control your breathing. Let your breathing be your natural reflex action. And uh, whenever there's an inhalation, we wish the breath well. And whenever there's an exhalation, we wish the breath happy. So the first and most important step uh, is to apply this loving kindness, make friends with the breath, <clears throat> yeah, we are not training the breath. We're actually uh, 
training the mind to let go of the breath. <clears throat> Just like earlier on, we are not training the hair, we are not training the nails, we are not training the teeth, and we are not training the skin. Yeah? So all these objects, uh, mental five aggregates. So similarly, when we <clears throat> feel the breath, that is also mental five aggregates. So do not struggle or force the mind or the breath in any way. Have a loving kindness to the breath. Inhale well, exhale happy. Okay, once we are at peace with the breath, then we can introduce the truth, right? introduce some Dhamma, introduce some teachings. <clears throat> so we are now going to observe. <clears throat> this is an evidential base, right? all the sensations of your in and out breathing. So there's nothing imaginary. So whatever sensation you feel when you breathe in and out, you need to observe its impermanence. It's rising and passing away. So you need to keep on uh, contemplating or reminding yourself of this impermanence until the mind detach. So there are all kinds of sensation, whatever it is, yeah? but we generally can classify into the uh, four elements. So the earth is uh, hard and soft sensations, fire, warm and cold, wind, fast, slow movements, and water moist or dry. <clears throat> so there's no need to purposely generate the uh, sensation. We just be a passive observer. We are trying to understand nature, yeah? the natural uh, reality of the mind or the breath. So every time you think, you generate the thought or the formation, you're producing five aggregates, every moment is birth. And when it changes, then there's a passing away. Yeah? birth and passing away of the various breath sensations. So mindful of this impermanence can help to create detachment. <clears throat> and the mind will settle. So 
So there will be a point where the rate of settling will be very negligible or sort of stop settling any further. Then this is the point of stability. And the uh, one pointedness of the mind. Or if you want to use a post canonical term, it is a kind of samadhi developed. Uh, through vipassana, yeah? through observing impermanence and having the mind calm and still. The attention at the nostril, right? That is the samatha aspect, and the detachment. Through impermanence is the vipassana aspect. So the whole idea when we talk about practicing detachment, we have to be mindful of this unclinging, right? When the mind settles, there's a reduction of formation, that's why it settles. And when the mind reacts, then that peace is gone, yeah? So the mind will start to <coughs> scatter again when it reacts with greed and aversion. So you need to Keep observing how it rises and how it settles down. So the settling down of the mind is the reverse order of the twelve links, and the uh, sort of uprising of the mind or the agitation of the mind is the forward order of the travelings. So once the mind is left idle, yeah, when we stop applying right thought, right thought will be the opposite of craving, right thoughts of non-greed and non-hatred. And once the mind is left idle and we stop having right thoughts, naturally the mind will be filled with all the wrong thoughts and all the thoughts of uh, <clears throat> have been daydreaming, can be fantasizing, sleeping, whatever. Yeah. So the whole idea of uh, reducing the desire requires lots of effort. Effort not as in the uh, forceful, coercive kind of effort, no, but the uh, frequency, yeah, the repetition, the increased repetition of the uh, contemplation. So if we are doing the observation of impermanence, yeah, the birth and death of the breath, then we need to keep on reminding ourselves of this impermanence all the time for the mind to remain settled. Yeah?
Okay, so once we are accustomed, yeah, accustomed to this uh, one small area, then we can train with a larger area. Yeah? So we can think of the entire body, expand the awareness from head to toe, right, sort of uh, fill this whole body with this awareness. And we see you know, whether do we cling to any sense contact of the body or do we practice not clinging. So it's two options. Option one, forward order and option two, reverse order. Yeah? Option one is uh, with craving and option two is with right thoughts and yeah? non-craving. And if you think you can maintain the peace with an extended area, then you may try yeah, a larger area. So this time we lift the uh, travel restrictions and uh, let the mind sort of uh, wander around freely. So the attention can move around through your eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or mind. Yeah? So the mind can be anywhere. So in this exercise, if you want to practice not clinging, you have to know where is the mind first, where is the attention first. So the way to track the mind is uh, observing the four elements, right? the various sensations we discussed earlier. So that four elements will encapsulate this attention. Yeah, Nama Rupa is together, mind matter, they yeah, are five in one, yeah. So this is the yeah, real time contact tracing of your attention. So you let the mind autopilot travel around freely without you deliberately directing the mind. Don't fix the mind anywhere. So the whole idea is to see things as they really are. So it'll be a passive observer. Then in this unrestricted large area, we still need to be mindful of the objective, yeah? practice detachment. So when the mind is all over the place, can it still practice detachment? So this uh, larger extended mind has uh, probably 0% samatha aspect 
and uh, more towards the vipassana aspect. Yeah? How to rely on scattered five aggregates to develop calm and peace. And for those who are agitated or disturbed by various sensations, you might need to reapply loving kindness first and yeah, soften the mind. Wherever your attention is at, yeah, reach that sensation well and happy. And uh, now we are going to transit to the next phase of meditation. So if let's say you are sort of well-versed right, in maintaining the calmness of the mind, then uh, now we are sort of trying to direct the mind in various directions, sort of multitask, uh, still uh, doing in a large area. I'm going to wish all beings in front well and happy. So the idea is, uh, can you intentionally direct the mind without uh, clinging? So if there's no clinging, that means there's no stress or tension. And we come back to ourselves. And next, we wish all beings behind well and happy. And we come back to ourselves. And we wish all beings on the left well and happy. <clears throat> and we come back to ourselves. And we wish all beings on the right well and happy. And we come back to ourselves. 
and we are going to reach all beings above well and happy. And we come back to ourselves and we wish all beings below well and happy. And we come back to ourselves And this time round, we wish the entire body again. Yeah, may this entire body be well and happy from head to toe. It's mindful uh, internally. See whether there's detachment or attachment. And eventually we are going to radiate this loving kindness in all directions, above, below, and all across. Starting with your house, may all beings at home be well and happy. Then we can think of a wider area. Uh, may all beings in the neighborhood be well and happy. And we can reach the entire country, wherever you are. May all beings in the country be well and happy. And we can wish the entire world, yeah, may all beings in this planet be well and happy. So let's extend the mind larger and wish for world peace. Make sure the mind also has inner peace. And eventually we are going to wish all beings in the entire universe, may all beings be well and happy.
And uh, before we conclude the meditation, there's another gentle reminder from the uh, current year, Metta Sutta. Right, so if a person were to maintain his boundless loving kindness, be it standing, walking, sitting or lying down, and this is the highest conduct. Yeah? <clears throat> so with that in mind, uh, we can formally end the meditation and gently open our eyes, but mentally we are still mindful and meditating. So actually it's every moment meditation. Yeah? So can be retreat every day. <laughs> Don't have to be purposely yeah? specifically on weekend. Right, okay, but uh, yeah, so this is the end of the session. Any uh, questions or issues on the ground? Okay, if there's no problems, then we can do the closing chant. Okay, so now we chant the uh, <coughs> Anmodana, dedicating merits. Akasataja Pumata, Deva Naga Mahidika, Punyatang Anumoditwa, Chiram Raka Tuloka Sasanam, Etavataja Mehi, Sampata Punya Sampadam. Sabi Deva, Sabi Kuta, Sabi Sata Anumodanto, Saba Saba Disidia. <coughs> Transference of merits to departed. Ida Menya Tina Hotu, Sukita Hotu Nyata Yo, Ida Menya Tina Hotu, Sukita Hotu Nyata Yo. Idang minya tina ho tu, sukita ho tu nyata yo. Aspiration. Imina punya kamina, mame bala samagamo, satang samagamo ho tu, yawani bala patiya. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Okay. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, Bante. No problem. So, a little bit announcement, Bante. Mm, yeah. Okay, for those uh, watching from YouTube, just a gentle reminder, this coming weekend, Saturday and Sunday, from 9 a.m., Bante is going to hold a meditation retreat. The schedule is inside the msps.my Facebook. To join the retreat, just you need to scan this QR code. The session will be on Zoom only. As Pante mentioned just now, today is the last lesson for November. You will start the next lesson in 1st December 2020. Okay, thank you Pante. Okay, Hi. thank you very much, Terence, and everyone else. And uh, stay good night. safe. Good night. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Good See you all this uh, weekend. <laughs> thank you.